Okay, so the recording's underway, and it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Andy Pitts, who will talk to us today about Unfinity Categories. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, so um, uh, what I'm going to talk about is that the, the background is um, the relationship between um, high dimensional category theory and, and type theory, um, and in particular, um, uh, using high dimensional category theory of various kinds to, to make models of, of, uh, of type theory, or maybe even of homotopy type theory. Um, so I, you know, obviously there are a lot of connections between those two things. Um, you might be uh, wanting to use type theory uh, in order to um, do some synthetic homotopy theory or something like that. So that, that that's not uh, what I'm interested in at this point. I'm, I'm uh, let's say, coming from the point of view of, of somebody interested in dependent type theory uh, who wants to see lots of interesting models of that formal system and uh, high dimensional category theory is, is uh, a source possibly of, of, of such models. And I'm thinking, of course, you know, historically, that kind of thing goes back to like the groupoid model of, of, of type theory of Hoffman and Streicher and uh, the work that Steve Audi did with Michael Warren uh, when Michael Warren was doing his PhD about intentional uh, identity types modeled using um, um, strict uh, infinity categories and so on and so forth. So, um, but the thing is um, that it's, uh, when thinking about models of type theory, it's not enough really to, um, interesting though it might be, to produce models of say of, of equality types with various intentional properties and sigma types and pi types. Uh, you've also got to, to um, uh, model universes because type theory is pretty weak pre-theoretically unless you've got uh, um, universes around in order to, to do things like uh, big eliminations uh, fr from inductive types and so on. And um, of course, for our homotopy type theory, we'd like universes which are univalent. Um, and I would personally like to, to see far more and also more simple uh, models of univalent uh, universes. And um, I think it's uh, um, not so easy because, um, uh, I mean, when one thinks of, of, of universes, say in set theory or, or in type theory, you might, might think really it's just to do with something to do with size. But um, here, size really isn't um, so much as an issue as, as what you might call the, uh, what some people have called the microcosmos problem. I mean, if we're making a model of type theory out of some kind of geometric or algebraic structures, um, to get a universe, uh, the universe has got to be another of those structures. So it's got to have, have the structure that you're interested in. And it can be uh, quite hard to see how to, to uh, make uh, a universe which is itself uh, one of these structures. Okay. Um, so I personally um, have a problem with the higher dimensional aspect of category theory, which is well summed up with this quote uh, I've got from a famous logician who I once heard uh, uh, make it. So this quote is in the oral tradition. He never wrote this down. So I, I, I've been a bit coy about saying who it is. But this famous logician was somebody who's famous for using category theory. And he made this remark at the end, I seem to remember, though it was a very long time ago, of some talk which was heavy duty Australian two category theory, uh, which is quite hard to understand. Um, but of course, if two category theory sucks, where does that leave infinity category theory? It's even worse. Um, and so the higher dimensional aspect of things uh, for me often gets in the way of, of trying to understand what, what's going on. I mean, it's either because I lack geometric intuition in higher dimensions, but that's probably not really the problem. It's just that all, all the kind of uh, algebraic details and keep, keeping the dimensionality around it gets uh, uh, quite tricky and I kind of lose the will to live at some point. Um, so a few years ago, I, I um, noticed that you can use nominal techniques to make dimensionality implicit, pretty much in the same way that, that if you're using uh, nominal techniques to reason about, um, say, uh, formal syntax with, with, with bound names, then you, you can make weakening implicit, and that's, that's quite a, a pleasant thing to do. So what I thought I'd do in this talk is I want to sort of air that idea again for a new public. Uh, some of you are new to me. 
uh, in case um, uh, somebody finds it useful. Um, I, it's not clear to me whether this idea really helps. I'd say that the jury is still out, but uh, um, I'm going to expose the ideas to you and, and take them in a certain direction and, uh, and, and leave it at that. So this talk doesn't is 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 um, going to be low on on um, on results. Um, it's it's sort of half baked, I suppose. And I, I hope uh, somebody will take it away and put it back in the oven and do something uh, interesting, maybe. So here's a map of of um, what we're going to do. So I, I'm going to I'm going to explain to you the, the sort of nominal view of, of, of uh, cubicle sets. Okay, and um, so uh, I have to tell you a little bit uh, about what nominal sets are, and I'll start by I'm by, um, just making a few remarks about about infinity, uh, uh, and then we'll we'll go off down a certain branch, uh, not the usual one, but uh, uh, towards um, thinking about high dimensional uh, categories in, in in that setting. Okay, so um, well, infinity is not a word. <laughs> uh, Andre Joyal coined the term. I think he was making a joke uh, when he did it, but actually I quite like the word, so I, I, I propose to, 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 to use it. If you're a classical mathematician, if you're working in, in, with classical logic, the law of excluded mid middle, infinity is just a typo for infinity. Um, you can't see any difference classically. Um, but what, what I mean by infinity is, it, it, constructively speaking, is that, well, first of all, it's uh, an infinite set uh, has a decidable equality, so, so we, we have um, a, a non-equality relation, which is the Boolean complement of, of equality, uh, so that's that straightforward. And then the important thing is that the set is finitely inexhaustible, okay, so um, uh, the notation I'm using here is, uh, so fin of upsilon is just the set of finite subsets of, of, of upsilon. I'm going to use the, sim the Greek symbol upsilon for infinity. Okay, so fin of, uh, of infinity is just the collection of uh, things generated by the empty set and the operation of, say, of um, taking a, a set and adding a, a singleton to it. And so we have a, a, a non-membership uh, uh, um, relation, uh, which we could also define inductively like that. So what we want of this, of this set, uh, infinity, is that for every finite set, uh, there's something in the set which is which is not in that finite set. And um, another thing to say about this is is that um, the existence is is mere, if if you know what I mean from from recent developments in homotopy type theory. We don't particularly want to scolarize that that statement and have an actual function that that produces. Uh, for a given finite set of, of things in the set, some particular thing which is not in that finite set. I mean, any one instance, I mean, the natural numbers is, a, is, a, is an infinite set. And of course, you can, you can have a function that produces, say, the, 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 um, the least thing uh, strictly bigger than all the things in the, in the finite set that you give it. Um, but it's not helpful, in fact, to, uh, to have that function. All we need to know is that there merely exists something which is not uh, not in, the, in that finite set. So for the rest of the talk, let's fix a particular infinite set. I mean, so you can think it's just the natural numbers if you like, but, but we're only going to use uh, these, these properties. And um, because of the context we're in, I'm gonna call the elements of that set dimensions uh, rather than atoms or something like that. And I'll write typical elements as, as X, Y, and Z uh, and so on like this. So, okay, so far, okay, so we're, we're, um, we're going to do nominal sets o over a particular uh, infinite set. So what, what is a nominal set? It's basically a set which comes equipped with some, some knowledge of, of it depending on the elements of the infinite set, on, on the dimensions. Uh, and the way we do this is in terms of uh, the set having a, an action of finite permutations of the dimensions. But I, I'll um, present that in the most elementary way that I can in terms of just having a, a, a function that uh, uh, you take um, an element of the set. So I'll call the element cells, uh, again, sort of to, to make you think in a certain way. So if I have a cell in the set and I have two dimensions, X and Y, I want to have an operation that, that uh, interchanges, that transposes the, the, the two dimensions and gives you back a, a new cell, which I'll write like this. 
Um, so I'll write swapping use, using this notation. And uh, that, that swapping operation on, on, um, on cells uh, just has some very straightforward properties. So if you, if you swap a dimension with itself, you don't do anything. Uh, if you swap X and Y and then swap X and Y again, uh, then you don't do anything. So uh, you can see here, I'll, I'll write um, um, sequential uh, compositions of, of, of swappings just by, by in a kind of matrix uh, notation. So this thing mean, means this, uh, this here. Um, we need that you can push swappings through each other. So if I swap X and Y and then I swap Z and W, that should be always the same as first swapping Z and W and then swapping what you'd get from X and Y by swapping Z and W in X and in Y. So, so this, this thing here is just a piece of notation. So it's either um, W if X is equal to Z and it's, it's um, um, uh, Z if, if X is equal to W and, and if X is not equal to either Z or W, it's just X. Okay, so this, this is just another dimension uh, that you can get, okay. So in fact, these three equalities are enough to ensure that we have a well-defined action of all finite permutations of, of the infinite set on the, on the set of cells C, okay. But we need, crucially, something a little bit more than that. We'd like that every cell only depends on finitely many dimensions. So we, we don't want to have infinite dimensional objects in, in, in our sets. And uh, we can capture the idea of only depending on finitely many dimensions via this swapping action. So we ask if you're gonna have a nominal set that every, every cell has a finite support. Okay, so for every cell in the set, there's some finite set of dimensions with the property that if you took two, two dimensions that weren't in that set and swapped them uh, in the cell, you'd do nothing. So in that sense, um, A only depends, uh, maybe it doesn't depend actually, but it depends most on things in, in this, in this uh, finite set X bar. And if you take two things outside that set, then swapping won't change anything. So a nominal set is a set equipped with this uh, swapping action in which every element has this finite support property. Can I, can I ask a quick question? I haven't actually seen this notation before. So what's the relationship between well, A? Uh, actually, Jamie, nobody has, because I made it up specially for this okay. talk. Nor <laughs> normally, one would, would write, uh, uh, if you read books on this, um, you would write something like, um, I don't know, um, the permutation that swaps A and B is often written like that, isn't it? And, and an action of a permutation is often written if, if you're doing left actions like that. So where I'm writing uh, this, uh, you, you probably more often see people write things like that. Okay, fine. But my question was going to be, what's the relation between AXY and AYX? They're equal. Okay. And we can prove that from, from, um, from, these, from these equations, actually, in okay. fact. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank Good question. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So that's what the objects of uh, we have a category of nominal sets, right? So a morphism of nominal sets. It's just a function where you um, uh, preserve the the permutation action, preserve, preserve the swapping. So, so it's function from C to D. And uh, if you um, if you apply F to something where you've done a swapping, you could first apply F and then do the swapping. So one sometimes say says equivariance for the property of of um, uh, commuting with with, with, a, with a group action, so so the morphisms are equivariant functions. So we get a category because obviously you can compose equivariant functions together, and they're still equivariant. And the identity function is equivariant. Uh, so I'll call that category nom for nominal sets. I mean, it implicitly depends on which infinite set we're talking about, but we'll, but we'll fix that um, uh, throughout. So I'll just write nom. So not nom. We know a heck of a lot about. Uh, that category and its properties. In fact, we know so much that there are whole books written about, about NOM. I wrote one book in 2013 and uh, Mikhail Bahanchik uh, uh, has written one essentially about the same category, though, though uh, the Warsaw people come at it from a set theoretic point of view rather than a category theoretic point of view. But, uh, uh, so there are plenty of places where, where um, you can read about this stuff and uh, I'm only going to pick out a very small amount of, of things that we need to know 
uh, here. And actually, I'm picking them out in a certain way. So neither of these books are written from a constructive point of view, uh, and neither of them are particularly oriented towards the application that we have in mind here with high dimensional category theory. I suppose were one to ever write a constructive version of the second book, it would be called Slightly Infinite Sets, but uh, uh, I think the chances of Mikawai doing that are very small indeed, since they're quite classical in their outlook. Okay, so one thing that we do need to know about nominal sets is, is one of the things, one of the constructions that you can make, which uh, in the original context was to, to do with modeling uh, uh, name abstraction in, in syntax, but here is to do with um, forming path objects. Okay, so I'll write uh, uh, this for the nominal set of paths uh, in, in a nominal set. So how do you get a path? Well, you take a cell and you, you take a dimension that you're interested in and you abstract with respect to that direction, that dimension, um, in the cell. Well, what do I mean by abstract? Well, I can get at it by just having um, an equivalence relation. So uh, if you have one pair consisting of a dimension and a cell and another pair of a dimension and a cell, I'll equate those two things. Uh, if once you swap X in, in A with some completely fresh dimension Z, you get the same thing as you would get by swapping uh, the dimension y and b for z. So here I'm using the um, freshness relation, another piece of sort of uh, nominal stuff. So if I write um, a hash x, so that would normally be written as a is fresh, x is fresh for a, but in this context it's probably better to think of it as that the, the cell a is degenerate in, in the dimension x. That's, that's sort of the appropriate way of thinking about it uh, in this context. But the, the mathematical definition is just simply that you can find some support set for A. So that's a finite set of dimensions where if you swap things outside that set, you don't change A, as we just saw in the definition of finite support. Some finite support set that doesn't contain X. So if you can find a, a finite support for A that doesn't contain X, we'll just say A is fresh. Uh, X is fresh for A. So the equivalence relation is that, that if you, when you've swapped X and Y for, for some fresh Z in A and B respectively, you get the same thing. Then we'll equate those pairs. And I'll write the equivalence class like, like this um, suggestively. So it's, it's like a form of, of uh, it is actually a linear lambda abstraction it's in this category. It's not a Cartesian, it's not quite a, an exponential that we're talking about here. It's a kind of linear implication and there's a, there's a corresponding uh, tensor product of which it's a right adjoint. Uh, this this p of c is p is a is a functor and it's right adjoint to to a certain monoidal thing. But we we don't need to know any of that here really. Can I ask a quick question, please. Yeah. Um, what role does the so in this angle bracket notation? Yeah. What role does the x play? Because it doesn't seem like the x was fixed in the definition or anything or. Well, so this, this is just my notation for the equivalence class of the pair. So you have a pair XA, and we've, oh, got, okay. we've got an equivalence relation. So you might have written it as, as the equivalence class of that pair or something. Okay, that makes sense. But, Thank you. Yeah, but I'm, I'm just writing it like this because actually it behaves like a kind of lambda abstraction. But it's, it's, it's the thing is in, in this world, um, you have, um, as it were, first class dependence. So A, um, a is, you know, an object that might might involve the dimension X, or it might not, you don't know, as it were, but, but, but we can abstract with respect to X. Um, so let me just tell you something about what you get. So you do get a nominal set, right? Well, first of all, what's, what's the, the swapping action? So if, if I swap some, some dimensions Y and Z on this equivalence class, uh, you just go inside and, and do the swapping on the X and the, and the A, and that's a well defined, um, a well -defined thing. And um, having made that definition, uh, then you can work out what freshness means in, in, this, uh, in this nominal set. I'm getting interesting background noise from somewhere. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, 
so it's it, it, it's a fact that if you put this permutation action so this swapping action on equivalence classes you not only do you get a well-defined permutation action but everything is still finitely supported uh, and uh, the support of of this equivalence class is basically the support of, of of a subtract x so y is fresh for this equivalence class if y is either equal to to the dimension that you're abstracting or y is already fresh for a so um, so this is not a definition this is something that you can work out uh, having uh, made this definition of the action and the other thing that we need to know is that there's a kind of um, analog of function application so a kind of uh, uh, um, linear version of, of, of um, a function application in this case so you can take a, a path and you can concrete it at, at some dimension that's well defined as long as the dimension is is sufficiently fresh uh, fresh for the, for the path and what you do is you just take the body of the of the abstraction and swap uh, x uh, for the thing that you're concreting and that's a well-defined operation as long as this side condition holds now I'm calling these things paths, but they're pretty pathetic sorts of paths at the moment because they don't begin anywhere or end anywhere. And the only thing you can do with them at the moment is, is you can abstract with respect to a dimension and you can concrete with respect to another dimension or maybe the same one, but you can't do much else with it. Uh, so for the purposes of representing name binding, that's perfectly adequate. But, but in this context, we need a little bit more than that. Okay, so that's... Um, uh, um, what we're going to do now is we're going to introduce the notion of cubicle set done in done in this style. So a cubicle set done in this nominal style, we're just going to add some extra structure to the nominal set, which corresponds to, to the ability of, of um, instantiating paths at a beginning point and an end point. So if you like, we're going to add, in fact, face maps is probably a good way of saying. So I'm going to have an operation and again, I, I don't know whether this is a great idea, but I'm going to kind of uh, continue to, to uh, kind of overload the notation. Uh, I want to have a, a function which takes something in a nominal set, an element of a nominal set, and takes a, dire uh, uh, a zero or a one, so that's a source or a target, as it were, takes a dimension, and gives me back something in, in, in the, a cell, again, in the nominal set, which I'll write like this. So think of this as substituting zero or one for the dimension x and the picture you should have in mind would be i mean if, if a was some kind of three-dimensional object so we've got dimensions x y and z okay then um, this operation might uh, for example here i i've instantiated x to be one so i'll get the face of that cube here which is uh, in the y z plane uh, at where x is equal to one uh, whereas here, if I, if I say abstantiate x and y both to be zero, I'm just going to get the part of the cube which is up the z-axis from zero to one. And if I instantiated all three things, I just get this point here, for example, if I took x to be one and, uh, and uh, y and z to be zero. So that, that, that's the uh, picture of what we want. But what we have to do is, is, is define mathematically what this operation should satisfy in order for this to be a, a valid sort of picture. Do we still have a, like a swapping interpretation? Sorry, could you say that again, Jamie? Your audio is a bit poor. Sorry, this is the, this is the same notation as before for your swapping operation. Yeah. Yes. Well, you can think you can think of it as swapping i and x, except that the i is zero and one, and they're fixed. So, so when you try and move i to x, you don't do anything. You just keep it at, uh, at one. So, uh, or, or, or if you would prefer, you know, I could perhaps it would have been better for me to write something like that, or indeed some other notation. But uh, uh, okay. uh, Andy, if the I mean, if the x y one is swapping x or substituting x for y, well, it's then it's just in some way substituting zero for x. Does it, that make sense? Yes, uh, I mean, I, I can see that my choice of notation was a big mistake, right, but, um, but never mind. Uh, so I've been writing this uh, where it's like two substitutions at the same time, y for x and x for y, right? Uh, whereas when I'm writing this, you, I'm, I'm trying to make you think it's just one substitution that x goes to y. Okay, but you'll never have a... Maybe, maybe I'll, write, I'll revise this notation after this talk, right? Clearly it's not working very well because it's just annoying you but uh, never mind right you we you can cope with it though can't you right it, 
if, if you see a zero or a one, I range is always over zero and one in, in this talk upstairs, then you know it's one of these face map things. And if you see a dimension name, then you know it's, it's an interchange, okay? You all right with that, everybody? I take silence as consent. <laughs> Just oh, um, relating to that though, we had application. Um, yeah. Can we apply uh, a path to zero or one? Yes, indeed. Uh, and that, that's exactly what I'm now going to tell you is okay. the structure. Yeah, indeed. So a cubicle set, right, is going to be a nominal set equipped with, with exactly uh, uh, two operations, uh, apply at zero and apply at one, if you like, okay. Um, and um, uh, what do those satisfy? So, so um, saying it's a morphism of nominal sets is going to sort of make, make that property of equivariance kind of automatic. Uh, and similarly, saying that I have a well-defined thing from this path nominal set back, back to C means that sending this equivalence class to this has to be well-defined on equivalence classes. And that turns out to be equivalent to asking for this condition. So that's sort of implied by, by, uh, by the functionality that I'm, I'm demanding here. So the equivariance and the binding property as one calls it uh, are kind of um, built in into saying, I'm gonna have a morphism in the category like that. But the, the, the properties that are not built in that we demand are, are two things. First of all, degeneracy, right? So, so if X is a dimension which is along which a cell A is degenerate, if I instantiate X with, with zero or one, then I should just get back A, right? So that's what we ask. And the other thing is that um, if, I, if I do some, some face maps in two different, two different dimensions, so X hash Y, you remember going back to the first slide means X doesn't equal Y then it doesn't matter the order in which I, 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 I do the two things. I, I can do first in X and then Y or vice versa. Now, some of you, I know um, Ian in particular, uh, are only too familiar with this kind of thing. So the, these are typical properties of what are called nominal restriction sets. Uh, and we know uh, a lot about the category of, of nominal sets equipped with a so-called nominal restriction operation. Sam Staten proved a, a nice theorem that it's equivalent to a pre-sheet topos. Uh, and so here basically we have the same kind of thing, it's just that we've got two different notions of restriction, kind of restrict to, to zero or restrict to one, and they commute with each other. Um, but you can still prove um, the same kind of theorem. Which is basically that, so the category of nominal sets equipped with that kind of face map structure and uh, equivariant functions that, that commute with face maps. So I'm going to call that category CUB for cubicle sets. That actually is equivalent to a known category of cubicle sets. So this, this pre chief category uh, sets to the C. C is a little category whose objects are finite ordinals and the morphisms are basically. Um, well, you're going to have, you know, for finite set M, you're going to have M, M names plus zero and one. So we look at functions from M plus two to N plus two, and we ask that the functions send zero to zero and, and, and one to one. And then we ask for them to be um, where they send things to dimensions to be uh, injective so that we're not allowed to send uh, X and Y both to, to the same Z. Um, we can send x and y both to zero or both to one, but if we're going to send it to, to a non-zero one thing, then we have to do that injectively. So that's a particular, uh, there are lots of different categories of, of cubes that are floating around in the literature, and this is just uh, one of them. And this turns out to be equivalent, the pre-sheaf category, to, to this uh, um, category of nominal sets equipped with, uh, with face maps. So if you're interested in how that's proved, then, then you can look at the paper and it, this is a, a um, quite a, a widespread phenomenon in the sense that there are other varieties of cubicle sets that you can treat in this nominal way. You can even treat simplicial sets in this nominal fashion uh, by making uh, suitable nominal sets with, with structure. So uh, Eric Faber's PhD thesis is a place to look at for, for um, some details about that kind of 
a variety of thing that you can do. So, so the thing is that uh, this pre-sheaf category uh, of cubicle sets, which we know now is equivalent to this category of nominal cubicle sets, is exactly the one that Besserman, Cochon and Huber used to produce the first um, constructive model of, of, of univalent uh, type theory. So they, they um, consider cubicle set, sets or families of cubicle sets, in fact, equipped with a certain kind of uniform version of can filling. And they're able to prove that in, in that, uh, for those kind of, uh, of can complete uh, cubicle sets, the path uh, functor is giving you uh, a model of intentional equality types. There are universes of can complete uh, cubicle sets. And moreover, those universes are univalent, so, so that equivalence uh, 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 of types in, in the universe is equivalent to, to, to uh, identity, where identity means a, a path in, in, in this sense. And, and that's all constructively valid. And I think it's not unfair to say that the details are quite complicated, actually. Um, and if you were to read their paper, you would get an impression of what's going on, but not all the way to the complete uh, details of, of how the univalent universe works. And it's taken the work of lots of people to, to, um, to work away at this and other models to, to try and make them simpler. But what I have in mind is to kind of take the fork in the road, right? Is, is, it, is it possible to do higher dimensional category theory in this setting and produce uh, a model of univalent type theory. Okay, so so um, so we're at this point in the roadmap. Okay, um, and instead of going down the path of considering uh, can complete cubicle sets and me telling you, as it were, a nominal presentation of of that work of of um, uh, BCH or or, or 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 other similar things, we're we're going to go off down this path here. Okay. Uh, so I want to think about um, what it might mean to, to have a, um, a category, a high dimensional category structure in this setting where we've kind of made dimensionality implicit. So that's going to involve us with, we've got these path nominal sets of, or cubicle sets of paths, right? Um, so clearly um, what we should be looking at is some notion of composing paths together right uh, a notion of path composition right so we'd like it to be a, at least a morphism of cubicle sets right and it's going to look like this if you've got a, a path p and a path q uh, where the um uh, the source of p is equal to the target of q then um uh, we can compose them together to get a path in c which presumably goes from the uh, the um, source of q to the to the target of, of p Okay, so satisfying some properties that, that we need to, to, uh, to say. But to, say, to give those properties, it, I, I find it helpful to, to um, instead of working in terms of this path object, to, to go back to the cells of C and talk about name dimensions. So if we've got an operation like this, right, we can kind of get a named version of it. Uh, so take two cells in C rather than two paths, two cells A and B, and compose them in a certain dimension X, okay? So you can get that kind of named version of composition out of the anonymous one, just by abstracting A and B with respect to, to the dimension. So those are two paths now, composing them using this path composition operation, and then just concreting the, the result to see uh, what it means uh, at at x, right? So that would give us an operation uh, of this kind, right? It would take two cells which happen to agree when you um, do face maps on the first to zero and the, and the second to one, uh, and gives you back a cell in in C, subject to to um, some uh, conditions. And that's an equivalent way of looking at things because. Um, if we'd got an operation like this, we can get back one like that, right? Because I can just define the composition of paths by um, just 
instantiating the paths at a suitably fresh dimension, composing along that dimension and then just abstracting with respect to that dimension. So I'm, here I'm indulging myself in a bit of, of, of structure that nominal sets have. Uh, you should think here, this is basically what I've got on the right hand side of this definition is just this thing here, where X is something which is fresh for P and Q, but actually any, anything that's fresh for P and Q uh, would do equally. And uh, so there's, there's a well-defined uh, local um, name declaration operation that's convenient to use and I'll, I'll carry on using it a little bit. Okay. So what I'm saying is, is whatever the notion of path composition is, we can do it in this rather more concrete named dimension version and um, you'd be able to move between the two things uh, interchangeably. And it's a little bit more convenient to, to uh, state what I want in terms of, of this named version. Okay, so what is it that, that, that we require this notion of composition to satisfy? So here, I think it's useful to remember um, a, a particular way that you can define what a category is, okay, which uh, might seem like, a, you know, an exercise, as it were. Um, so there's a unisorted way of saying what a category is. So we can, we, instead of saying category consists of objects and morphisms and various operations, we can just say a category consists of morphisms and we'll identify the objects as the, the identity morphisms in, in that set of morphisms. Okay, so from that point of view, you've just got one set C, you've got a source and a target function giving you the source of C as an identity morphism and the target of C as an identity morphism. You've got a composition uh, operation that takes pairs of things that agree source target and gives you back something. And you have the, um, um, the globular identities. Uh, the source and target of composition should be what you expect. This is the unitary law. So A composed with an identity is, is A and a post composed with an identity is A, and, and we know which identity by using source and target and uh, associativity. So that's just a way, you know, you probably, you maybe have seen this as, a, as an exercise. I think I even in my category theory course, probably at some point in the past, set it as an exercise. It's an entirely equivalent way to, it say, in, in ordinary uh, set theory to, to present uh, the notion of category. Here it's very convenient though, because if you think about it, the, the, these cubical sets are done in this nominal way. We just, we have this collection of cells where their dimensionality is completely implicit, right? So we've got all the north cells and the one cells and the two cells and the three cells and the four cells all together in one thing. And we haven't even really got not one, two and three. We've got a one element set of dimensions. There are lots of them singleton x, singleton y. We've got a two element set, say singleton x, y or singleton y, z or whatever. We've got a three element set and so on. And, and uh, the cells depend on, on, on things in that way. Okay. But it's natural to, to use a definition of category that, that's, that's fitted up to, to that framework, right? So, so that's what we can do. Okay. So what I'll call a, a, a strict infinity fold category. So the fold is because I'm talking here about, um, if I got my terminology right, I hope so. So category, double category, triple category, quadruple category, n fold category, the limit is infinity fold category. So that's different from uh, category, two category, three category, four category, limit, omega category. Okay, but, so but, but in the that's right, but in a double category, we have horizontal cells and vertical cells, and these are yeah. necessarily the, the same, they could be completely distinct. Yes, okay, so so uh, I'll mention that. So I am talking specifically about ones which are ed so-called edge symmetric. Right. Yeah, that's right, yeah. No, I'll, I'll mention that in a second. So what what do I want? Well, I'll, I'll have a, an operation of composition, okay? And um, uh, it's equivariant and it respects the, 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 the face maps. So I won't say explicitly what that is, but that's just saying that we have a morphism of cubical sets. And then the important things are that, you know, the, the, the source of the composition is, is the source of B, the target of the composition is the target of A, uh, this is the unitary laws, that's the associative law. And then we want the analog of, of, of what you see in, in, in uh, n-fold categories, right? But we only have to say one thing, it's 
because we just need to have two different dimensions and ask that the, the compositions uh, commute in, in the sense of the interchange law. So we ask for, for this law here, okay, which is, is uh, so it looks like we're kind of doing double categories, but we're actually doing arbitrary, you know, and n fold for, for, for any n, but using named dimensions. And uh, so a functor of such things would just be a, a morphism of cubical sets that, that preserves composition. Okay, and you don't have to say anything more, more than that. Okay, so identities will be preserved automatically because of the way the cubical things are set up. So I would expect to sort of answer Jamie's implied question that uh, what I've just defined is probably equivalent to the category of so-called strict edge symmetric omega fold categories, but I've not actually checked that, but I would be surprised if, if it were false. Okay. And uh, I imagine you could get strict omega categories by, by um, putting a little bit of extra structure, so-called connection structure that, that Ronnie Brown and various of his co-workers are, and, and other people have looked at. So, so, um, so I, 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 I would expect there to be a, a nominal characterization in this style of strict omega categories. But I haven't proved that, uh, but, it, but it's an expectation. Andy, can you say what edge symmetric categories are? Yes, it's, it, 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 I can. Let me do it here. Um, so in, I can, in a double category, right, you have like morphisms vertically and you have morphisms horizontally, and they may be two completely different classes of things, right? Yeah. Well, in, a, in an edge symmetric double category, they're all drawn from the same class. Uh, and you might have the ability to to um, to flip a, a diagram over uh, and, and and if you see what I mean to, to okay. yeah and it, and indeed um, we do have that ability here because we're treating all dimensions as as, as interchangeable and so you, you we don't have really the ability to to um, talk about things that are not edge geometric in in this in this way. Cool. So the the question that interests me. Is, is there a universe of, of uh, infinity fold categories? And I, I wanted to just um, uh, briefly explain what I mean by that question. Okay. So to do that, I just need to note that the, the path, the cubical set of paths, actually, if you're doing it on, a, on one of these un, un, infinity fold categories, you get another infinity fold category. Okay. So, so um, not only does this path nominal set have cubical structure, so so we can we can we can have face maps. Basically, you just do the face map on on uh, on on the the body of the thing that you're abstracting. Uh, but also, you can compose together um, paths just by by composing together inside C. So the the category structure on C is inherited by, by into into the path category. So we we get a, a, an infinity fold category structure on paths. And in fact, we get a category object in cubical sets. So you've got um, the path category. Uh, you've got a notion of composing paths. We've got identity paths. So the, the, if you've got a cell, you can make a path which is just constantly at that cell by, by abstracting with respect to a fresh dimension. And, and we, we get um, something which is well, more than just, but is at least a, 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 an internal category object in, in this category of cubical sets, okay? And of course you do have um, the ability to take uh, kind of global sections. So we can take the collection of zero dimensional things and that will get us back into, into sets. So every strict omega uh, infinity fold category, uh, we can basically take the zero dimensional things in, in, in this internal category. And that would give us back um, a category, an honest to God category. So what I'm asking actually is, um, is there a, a large strict infinity cold, uh, fold category U so that when you do this, you get back the category of all small infinity fold categories and functors. So that, that would be, that would be one way in which you'd have a, uh, a, a universe inside uh, the category of, of, of infinity for all categories, something that, that when you when you look at its global sections gives you gives you back this actual category of, of, of infinity called categories.
categories. So um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I suspect the answer is yes, but I don't actually see quite how to how to construct such a thing of a few ideas, but but nothing uh, definite at the moment. I would point out that this, I mean, there are plenty of universes in, in the category of cubicle sets. You can do Hoffman Streicher style uh, universes because we're, we're equivalent to a pre sheaf topos. So every time you've got a, a growth and universe in the category of sets, you can make a, a universe object in, in, in pre sheaves and so hence in, in cubicle sets. But those are not going to be things that are, that are going to have a composition structure, a path composition structure on them. Uh, so that they're not. Um, they're not uh, relevant really to, to uh, immediately relevant to, to this question. So um, just to, to get towards the end of this talk, of course, if you're going to model type theory um, rather than directed type theory, you'd need to consider groupoids rather than categories. Um, now, I think it's um, you could consider just the definition I had in asking that the, the, the paths have strict inverses with respect to, to composition. So that's going to be like the equivalent of a strict omega groupoid. But I, I'm sure that that is, is too strict, too strong. Uh, I mean, after all, the, 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 the model of type theory that Audi and Warren look at with strict omega groupoids doesn't, doesn't as far as I know, have uh, univalent universes. I don't think it does, whether, whether anybody's proved that it doesn't, but, but it's not known to. In fact, they don't really treat uh, universes uh, in, in that work at all. So recently, I, I um, uh, attended uh, virtually uh, a hottest seminar by uh, Norihiro Yamada, and uh, he's claiming to have a, um, within his uh, game semantics model of type theory that, that he developed uh, with, with Samson Abramsky, uh, a model of homotopy type theory, a model of univalent universes. And he's using some notion of, of strict, strictly associative, but uh, non-strict inverse kind of omega category in, in his category of, of, of games, which when I heard this seminar set me thinking about this stuff and the end result is me giving this talk. What I would like to know is the extent to which what he's doing is it can be done without having to, to, um, to use the intentional world of, of games. Can, can you do something uh, like this uh, without that? So um, it would be, I think, very interesting to look at this notion of, of infinity fold category and uh, go to groupoids where you ask that all the cells are equivalences, so by invertible uh, things. So it's so a weak, weak notion of inverse, not, not, not a strict version of inverse. Uh, is there a universe of, of, of such uh, things inside uh, inside the large collection of such things, and, and, and is it univalent? I don't know. Um, so uh, that's the end of my talk. Uh, so the road might go to a positive answer or, or might not. I, I just don't know. Uh, uh, but may, maybe uh, 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 one of you finds this stuff sufficiently interesting to, to uh, to, to try and find out who knows anyway but thanks thanks for listening if you want the slides there at this uh, this uh, point but uh, that's the end thanks thanks very much andy so now i'm going to unmute everybody and we're going to start to say um uh, congratulations andy for a nice talk okay i think i've unmuted everybody so let's say thanks andy for a nice talk. <laughs> Uh, okay. So, who would like to begin the interrogation of Andy? So, something that uh, that I'm not sure of. Um, I don't see any reason why strict things should not be univalent. I don't see a, a, a contradiction there. Right? But you're muted, Andy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I'm very interested to hear you say that. I, I, I'm sufficiently in an expert in this subject to not have an opinion. I just got the impression that that through um, you know things that 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 algebraic topologists tell me about uh, nasty things that that 
happen with with um, you know um, uh, um, what is what is it you know not not every tri category is, is equivalent to a strict three category. Uh, right, but that's but why don't see why that's no, I don't either, right? But and the reason I don't is because, of course, we don't, as it were, fully understand the import of univalence. And one one way of better understanding it is to have more models. So so that that's my. You, you, I mean, I would love it, right? If if uh, what you said was true, uh, because the simpler the better, right? And so, uh, so for example, there's probably. I mean, it seems impossible, but not the case that there's a strict infinity category of strict infinity categories. That seems. Yes. Well, that, that, that's, that, that, that's that's uh, when I started thinking about this. I assumed that that was obvious, and I'd be able to read about it somewhere. And for the life of me, I can't find any real literature on this. Right. But let's say. But, but okay. Let's say that that. The case, but well, let's consider that as a statement, which could be true or false, I suppose, a priori. Yeah. Um, now that's in a direction setting, of course, right, with the strict infinity categories. Yeah. Um, two points, necessarily. Um, is this statement morally close to what univalence means in a direction setting? Because people normally talk about it in univalence infinity one setting. So, what does it mean to be talking about univalence? establishing universe in a directed setting. Yeah, well, I mean, there, there are two different things, right? So, so to have univalence at all, you have to have a model of, 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 a, of identity types, right? So the, the first problem is that the, the strict omega categories or the strict omega groupoids even might not, you might need to, to um, they might need to have a, a connection structure or something like that, maybe, or maybe not. You first of all have to check that you've got identity types, and then then you could ask, you know, um, and if you've also got universes of them, then 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 you'd be in a good position to check whether okay, right, the right. Object okay. In the universe coincide with identity of objects uh, in in some way. Yeah. Okay, so just check I understand more your terminology. So yeah. Suppose we establish that there's, for example, a strict infinity category, of strict infinity categories. That's nothing to do with univalence yet at all. This is just establishing we've got something we can call a universe. Yes. And now univalence you want to be a property of this yes. universe. So is that what's the sort of generic or model independent way you can express what it means for that universe to be univalent in a way that would work for directed, undirected, cubicle? Well, I don't I don't think we have a very good answer for you, Jamie. I mean, yeah. the, only, the only answer I can give you is to set up. Um, we, we know a lot about what you need to model intentional equality types now in various ways. So, so um, and, and there are there are more or less easy ways of, of doing that. Uh, so that's part of the way towards your, your answer. But but, you know, I mean, how, how does univalence work in the known models? Well, I'm most familiar with the the the, the cubicle sets one. Not actually not the BCH one. But the 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 one that came afterwards, using a slightly uh, more generous notion of cubicle set, where you've got connection structure and so on. But there, you, you, the 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 key thing is that you somehow have to um, uh, be able to turn an an equivalence of cubicle sets, which is like naively speaking, two functions in each direction that that do some stuff that make them an equivalence, right, into a path. Of cubicle sets, so that's going to be an in an interval indexed family of cubicle sets, right? And that's what this so-called gluing construction is doing in in the models is somehow manufacturing out of a out of a partial equivalences, uh, part actual paths. Uh, so there's a sort of uh, a lifting property for. Oh, but what does this have to do with invertibility? Couldn't you just say that you want to be able to translate a functor between yeah um true I, 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 um yeah uh, that, that may be true so so I, I i mean in my head I, I i the difficulties that i see stopping me doing this are more to do with un understanding how you can get the universe at all than than that also getting it to be univalent right i mean because naively it's exactly what you said so the naive model of univalent should be take take omega groupoids right and um it should be literally the case 
that, that an equivalence of omega groupoids is the same thing as a path from one to the other. Uh, and the interesting thing about, about um, um, uh, what's his face, Yamada's thing, I mean, no, we, we can't see the details because I don't think he has a paper on it at the moment, unfortunately. Um, but um, he is actually claiming that his model of univalent universe is a model of univalence in which, in which it's not just that the paths are equivalent to equivalences, but actually they're definitionally equal. So there's a very strong thing. Uh, and that, that in itself, I don't think uh, there's a known model of uh, other than, than what he's claiming, right? Uh, so either he's wrong and, and some, something's wrong somewhere, or he's right and it's very interesting. But of course, the difficulty is, first of all, we can't read about it quite yet. And, and, and second, even when we do get to read about it, up there with high dimensional category theory for me, I'm afraid it's also game semantics where, where the various notions of strategy make, make, make me lose the will to live <laughs> very rapidly as well. So I kind of would hope to extract from what he's doing a purely sort of set theoretic or category theoretic thing, which is kind of what set me thinking about this stuff again after, after a gap of several years. Um, uh, and again, I might be being naive because it could be that that you need somehow the intentional nation, no, nature of, of game categories in order for, for 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 your notion of equality to be sufficiently fat to, to coincide with, with appearances of objects. But, but who knows? Hmm. Yeah. So maybe maybe one thing that's important, like to distinguish, is uh, that univalence it, it might have two different meanings in the sense that you could have a semantic version of univalence and uh, an internal or, or, or the statement of univalence in the language, right? Yeah. So like, um, and it often happens even in homotopy theory that univalence is kind of trivial if I, uh, if I think about it semantically. So if I, for example, if I think about the space of spaces or the space of con complexes, then it's univalent by definition, because when I define the space of con complexes, I say what the paths are. But that's different than saying there's a interpretation of type theory in the category of con complexes for which the internal axiom of univalence is satisfied. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. so, so, so you can have these sort of semantic versions of univalence where like the, for example, if you say, uh, I want to know, is there an uh, infinity groupoid of infinity groupoids? And then it will be univalent by definition because you're gonna give the definition where the one cells in this object are functors or are equivalences. Yeah. Or you can also you can also sort of talk about univalence without actually having the universe around, which is kind of what, what I am, one of my former students in Orton was ended up doing in the sense that you, you can have, as it were, interval indexed families of, of things without, uh, you know, which have good properties without knowing that they're coming that they live in that, some, from, you know, some classifying thing right. for, for, for the vibrations. Right. So, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the, the construction I have in mind for the universe in this thing is actually quite close to, I think, what you, almost what you were saying, which is that you can make a, a inside cubical sets, you have a large cubical sets, you, you have an internal category object or groupoid object whose whose objects are the cubical sets and whose morphisms are equivalences of cubical sets. So the problem is that that's not itself yet an object. Um, it's not yet uh, one of these internal category things because the homs have to be given by paths, whereas here the homs are given because you define them mm. separately. But mm. if there were a classifying space construct that, that was able to turn every internal groupoid into a an object, a space, as it were, where where um, you know the notion of of, of home was represented by by mm -hmm. by equality. Then then we'd be there, I think. It's just I can't at the moment quite see what that that uh, so the equivalent of BG, as it were, if you know what I mean, mm -hmm. um, uh, turning turning a group object in, into into a space so that mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. um, the group action becomes the actual uh, you know canonical action that you have for proofs of equality. Yeah, I see this thing like like the rest completion or something. Yeah. So so uh, that's that's my thought of uh, probably how it might go, but I can't quite see what the what the construction is. But uh, but it might work. You never know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, on aren't, aren't you going to struggle with mod modeling um, type theory with if you're trying to model it with a strict category? Won't you struggle model modeling all these um, homotopy types that 
presumably live in whatever type theory you're trying to model or am I missing something? Well, again, I think that's basically the same question as Jamie's, really, because on the face of it, you might think the answer is yes and there's no hope. But actually, the more you think about it, you realise you don't really know why why it's not possible. I mean, obviously, I mean, some things are just... So so it, it's not possible to model all homotopy types with strict categories, but that doesn't rule out, in my opinion, yeah. or as far as I know, there, the existence of some univalent model. Yeah. And that, that, that goes back to what I said at the beginning. So I, I'm, I'm not really in this work at all interested in, in what, in the homotopy hypothesis, right? In, 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 in getting something that represents all homotopy types. I just want to get a model of, of univalent type theory and you right, might, in which you might be able to do that. And, and, and it might not represent all, all possible, um, you know, tame spaces. Uh, so we're saying having, introducing univalence doesn't force you to have to have every sort of homotopy type available. Oh, no, I don't know. Okay. I'm certainly I think just, that's the bit I was missing from. I mean, after all, in the, the groupoid model has certain kinds of univalence. It's just not uh, a model of univalent type theory because the universes are not kind of nested within each other. So you, you have a univalent universe for, you know, um, um, discrete thing, you know, for, for, for truncated things and so right. on. So, so, yeah, it's uh, totally possible, for example, that the that two homotopy types would, which would be independent in the model in ordinary homotopy types somehow become the same in some other model. Yeah. So that inside the language, the language thinks they're different, but the model thinks they're the same. That's totally fine. There's no... Yeah. And if univalence is interesting and important, and I think it is, you know, it's a fascinating idea, I think, sort of, you don't see new extensionality principles coming along very often uh, in your lifetime. It, it certainly deserves to have um, simple, graspable models, is kind of what I'm asking for, but, but uh, uh, yeah. Which so, is not, I don't want to, of course, run down the, the beauty of, of, of uh, say, you know, um, the simple simplicial sets model or the cubical sets model. I mean, they're, they're, they're fantastic, but, but maybe, maybe we can find even simpler things than that. Uh, so is part of the problem that, at least I'm trying to get my head around this, is part of the problem that if you, you, you could possibly just say, oh, I want my notion of equality, um, my interpretation of equality to be equivalence in my groupoid, but then it would be hard to show then you sort of get univalence of three, but it'd be hard to show that your quality was nicely behaved or something. Yes, I mean, you, you start off down that road and then you immediately realize what you've got to prove is, is basically that equivalences can be transported around. Which is what you wanted in the first place anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So there's this statement that um, um, strict n-fold groupoids do satisfy do meet the homotopy hypothesis, which I've never understood at all. Oh, is that true? Oh. Well, you read it in various places. <laughs> that doesn't mean I... right. Okay, yeah, yeah. So it's on the NLAB, I've just double checked, for example. Yeah. The NLAB page on NFOLD categories. I think some of this work of Simona Powley has been about this. Yeah. Did anyone say something useful about that? No. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want to say anything about that because it's kind of in a direction that I, 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 I you know, I, I'm glad if it's true, but 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 um, it's it's not it's not what's lighting my fire, as it were. Oh. Yeah. So so some so something that that I've spoken to Yanis about in particular is thinking about um, mul these 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 uh, n, n these fold categories where we don't have this symmetry property right where we where we allow the vertical cells to be completely just vertical one cells to be completely distinct from the horizontal one cells yeah right but the sort of naming problem we get there is um in particular so, so and so any one cell is associated with a particular direction okay so i might have uh, a, a two category C with um, some one cells in direction X and some one cells in direction Y. And I might have another two category C prime with one, some one cells in direction P and some one cells in direction Q. Now, can C and C prime be equivalent to each other? Well, maybe we would say, well, for that, we would certainly require X to be P and Y to be Q, if you see what I mean. So the directions yeah. of the cells of, of C yeah. should be the same direction as C prime. 
But another perspective is we don't care what those directions actually were. And uh, they were just arbitrary direction labels without any meaning outside the, the, the category. Um, doesn't seem that that's so alien from what you're doing. I guess I'm saying it doesn't seem to me essential to, to, in the way you're to use the, with the techniques, the normal techniques you're using to have this symmetry property. Do you think you could treat the sort of thing we're talking about? Yeah, I, I'd not seriously thought about it, but I, I, it would be nice if that were, 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 were true. Um, you'd have to have it. Yeah. Um, does it make sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling to see whether it makes sense. Be where I mean, because uh, when I, when I in my setting when I interchange two dimensions x and y as it were, it, it, it's acting on th all things of the same kind as it were. Whereas whereas uh, mm -hmm. you, you're wanting kind of a different flavour of things in in one direction mm -hmm. than, than in another. I don't know. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to say something about that? Because I know you've thought a lot about these normal ideas. I mean, I, I don't have any idea about it either, but that's what I've been thinking for most of the talk today, to be honest. If it's possible to get um, categories which are not edge symmetric, uh, and full categories that are not edge symmetric using nominal techniques. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, mean I, I, I suppose I'm being very single minded about this because, um, uh, you know, I'm after a particular sort of thing. And if you're going to get it, you're going to get it here uh, rather than in, than in this more general thing. In fact, I, I'm not being entirely honest with you because because my my money is in fact not on uh, quite the uh, category of cubical sets that I've described in this talk. I, I described this one because it has an intimate relationship with nominal sets, which is a subject very close to my heart. But actually, in fact, there's a there's a, a slightly simpler uh, setting which I believe is probably the one still still a kind of same kind of nominal approach. But where you you do cubical sets with diagonals, so so um, uh, in other words, instead of looking at the group of permutations of the dimensions, you just have the monoid of all possible. Um, um, you know, you you allow you allow mm. uh, um, substitutions of not just of zero and one for x and y, and swapping x and y, but you allow you know to to send x and y both to z and things like that. The reason for doing that is because um, suddenly uh, some things become much nicer. So path types literally are exponentials instead of being linear exponentials. They're, they're, there's, there's an interval object and, and the path type is just the exponential to that interval. Uh, and a lot of um, calculations become a lot simpler. The, the downside is that you have to work not with um, uh, group actions, but with monoid actions, and so exponentials are just a little bit more complicated to describe than they are. I mean, the beauty here is is that an exponential is given by a, a function of finitely supported functions, as it were, from from cells to cells. In the monoid setting, you you have to do functions that that are not just of the cells, but also of the potential substitution. So it's a, it's a kind of Kripke style thing. Which is a little bit irritating, but but workable with, yeah. There is another way of getting rid of dimensionality that I didn't mention at all. What what we did in the five or six years <laughs> since I had that thought was was the why the jury is still out in my head is because we went off and did something completely different, which is to work in the internal language of type theory to describe, for example, what's going on in the CCHM model. So there there you it's a different way of. Of, of, of not having to get down and dirty with the combinatorics, as it were. You, you just use type theory as a language in which to describe what you're doing. And it's possible probably to do that here um, to a certain extent. But it won't, it won't, as it were, help with the basic question of, is there a universe and is it univalent? Mm -hmm. So, so I, I'm, a, I'm a bit confused about why you haven't given like a crisp statement of univalence in the model. Because you, you stated what your universe structure is. Sorry, your, your, your audio breaks up, so I'm finding it hard to say hear what you're saying. Say it again. You've given a, a crisp statement of the universe, right? Can you not hear me at all? I, I, I can hear the beginning, but not the end. But I see Santa has a little helper with him. Yeah. 
Um, you've given a statement of the universe structure. Yes. But you have well, I did, are you, You're saying I didn't bother to tell you what univalence is. Right. I mean, what? Yeah. Can you not well, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. 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 You're right. I didn't. So can you do can you do it, or do you not know how? Or no, no. I just um, uh, wanted to do other things in the fifty minutes, right? But uh, yeah. Yeah. But you can write some statement, some algebraic statement in your system that will correspond to univalence, or. Well, no, because I mean, it's not yet a model of type theory, right? So, so I know what univalence means in terms of dependent type theory. And, and once we have an interpretation of, of the constructs of type theory in interpreting your model, I can tell you what univalence means. But we're not quite at that point with this, right? Because um, univalence involves knowing what, how to interpret identity types. Well, that's not so hard. I could kind of tell you what, what you know, the, the path type isn't yet quite an identity type. It's got, um, um, hang on a moment. If I just go back. It, it's got REFL, there's REFL, right? So it's got reflexivity. Um, so you've got the, you've got the uh, formation and the introduction rule of equality, but what you need is the elimination rule, right? Uh, the J part. So that's that's you. You're going to have to need to need to know more about your cubicle sets. So that's where the, the can uniform structure comes in. For example, you, you know. So so at the moment we don't have a model of identity types here. You have to have a little bit more uh, uh, structure in in cubicle sets in order for it to model identity types. So that's one thing. But we also don't have a universe yet. But once we've got that, then then we could state univalent. So so actually I'm coming around to the I the the. I'm too apologetic. Of course, I didn't state what univalence means because we, we don't have the means to say what it means in this setting yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm not, I could tell you what it means in type theory, but, but that's a little disappointing if we don't have the model of the type theory. I thought you were going to say something like if you have a if you have a universe, yeah, then you can interpret univalence as a statement about the universe behaving sufficiently nicely as a model of the original. Well, theory. yes, but, it, but it, 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 it's a property with respect to, to identity types, right? I mean, univalence says that equivalence, so, you know, equivalence in the universe uh, of objects in the universe is equivalent to, to identity of the object. So, so you first of all have to, to, to explain how to in interpret identity types um, before you can even say what the univalence means. And actually, in fact, you really need two universes as well, because uh, uh, equivalence lives in one universe, but the equality between objects in the universe lives in the, in the upper universe, right? So, yeah. Can I ask what roles, um, I don't know if you have, if you have more to say, Jamie, may I let you go first? But, no. um, can I ask what roles C, so you got the, the C, which was the cubicle set, as I understand, and this Paths of C. So, what was the like? What roles did they play? Was it? Uh, was yeah. I, I think I got a bit confused somewhere. As what are we calling sort of the the cells of the category? Are they the elements of C or the elements of paths of C or both or neither? So I would if you if you if you think of uh, naively as, as a category as this one sort of kind of thing. So we say what a category is by saying what it's what collection of morphisms are, then okay. you can think of the elements of a my cubicle set as somehow wanting to be the morphisms in some category or some higher category, as it were. So you've got you've got the, the, the elements of the cubicle set are, you know, the, the ones that depend, don't depend on any dimension, uh, they'd be like the, the naught cells and the ones So these are living in C in C, not in, in, in C in C you've got naught cells, one cells, two cells, they're all all mixed up together. With the dimensionality being implicit, in other words, if you if you pick an element of the cubicle set and you give it me, I can look at it possibly and say, oh yeah, that depends on forty three different dimensions. So it's actually a you know it's in a more conventional presentation of, of cubicle sets, it would be in in C sub forty three. <laughs> but uh, so we're kind of taking the 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 co limit of all those C sub n's and taking one jolly big set. Uh, or with all the things mixed up together with oh. one layer identified 
with the next through identities, through degeneracy. So you, you couldn't know, just compose to sell cells, you have to sort of abstract them over some paths, some direction first to then compose them? Or? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So you have to you have to say what what direction you're going you're gonna... to. Oh, of course, because your composition was like completely general in direction and yeah. dimension. Yeah. Yeah. So then you have to sort of specify which direction you're going to do stuff over and then do the composition. Yeah. And, it, and if you were to work out the details of the equivalence with the conventional presentation of, say, uh, you know, omega fold, strict omega fold categories, which I haven't done, but, but, but I can imagine how one would do it, then you would see exactly, you know, how, how what's going on here pans out with, with what you're more used to. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are quite a few advantages in doing it this way. So I've been thinking, having sort of um, been prompted by by Jamie and Eric into finding out what the hell transfer fours are, uh, um, that actually there's a very, very easy description of, of the cubical set of transfers. I mean, it's almost trivial um, to, to say what it is in this setting, uh, um, which is kind of nice. So you, so you get a cubical set of morphisms um with with a with a category structure on it um from from two of these category objects so so that's quite cool uh, mm -hmm. yeah um so so i've got a kind of enriched uh, object here you know the, the objects are these these infinity categories and and the, and the morphism morphisms form infinity categories so the homs are, are themselves infinity categories but but what i want to do is have somehow uh, put that all together into one universe. Mm -hmm. Not quite the same thing as having an, in, an enriched structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Andy. That's super interesting. OK, thank you for listening, everybody. I'm yeah. sorry, it's uh, um, this was uh, originally meant to be a discussion between uh, interested parties, but it kind of blossomed into a general seminar. And I apologize for people who are still with us who, who uh, you know, are maybe not so, so interested in the uh, in these questions, but there we are. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Things a bit, a bit less, a bit less formally. Yeah. OK, good. Right. Time for tea. All right. Thanks again, Andy. <laughs> right. Thanks, Andy. See you later.